With the release of Final Fantasy VIII, there was a huge shift within the company of Square Enix. Square Enix's business model had completely started to change as they realized that the West was a huge market for potential sales. The company internally started to take a look at what it would take to bring their games over and make them even more popular in the West. One of those games was Final Fantasy VIII. Yoshinori Katase and his team decided to try to make a game that would cater to the West, even being inspired by Western cities and cultures when trying to create their world. Final Fantasy VIII would also go on to be a rather divisive title, as many people to this day still really love Final Fantasy VIII and what it brought to the table, but there are a section of the fans that were very disappointed about what Final Fantasy VIII would try to do. This has left the fan base very scattered on whether or not Final Fantasy VIII is a great game. And at the end of the day, I can't convince anybody that it is. But I can offer up my opinion and it definitely try to make a case why I think some of the hate towards Final Fantasy VIII is unwarranted. And in today's retrospective, we're going to take a look back at the game and see how it holds up and see if it's really as bad as people remember. So sit back, relax, subscribe to the channel, and let's dive into our retrospective of Final Fantasy VIII. Our story opens up with one of the most beautiful and memorable openings in all of gaming history, accompanied by the beautifully orchestrated Liber Fatalia, a series first fully orchestrated song. During a sparring match, Squall and Cypher are both injured. Squall wakes up in the infirmary after visiting Dr. Katawaki for his wounds. Squall and Quistus make their way to the fire cavern to obtain a low level GF and check off the prerequisite for the seed exam later this afternoon. Seed is a military mercenary group dispatched all across the world. Squall and the other mercenaries in training are tasked with assisting the Dolet military in holding back the invading Galbadian army. Turns out, Galbadi invaded Dalit to get a satellite tower up and running in order to broadcast and introduce the new ambassador of Galbadia, Sorceress Edia. Squall and the other new graduates, Zell and Selfie, are stationed in Timber and tasked with helping out the Timber Owls, a small resistance group fighting against the Galbadian army. Squall and the other seed members find themselves fighting against Galbadia in an attempt to stop the sorceress from gaining power and taking over the world. Final Fantasy VIII gets criticized a lot when it comes to its junction system. This is in a lot of ways because it's fairly easy to break the game and become very overpowered early on in the game. It also doesn't help for newcomers, the junction system is just very hard to wrap your head around. The junction system is what you will use to become stronger since enemies level scale with Squall. Each party member is able to equip a GF or a Guardian Force. These are this game's version of summons. Each GF will have certain stats you'll be able to equip to magic. Think of these as a replacement for armor or somewhat weapons. Junctioning magic to a stat will increase that specific stat, so say we were to equip Blazaga to Squall's strength, this would increase the amount of damage Squall could dish out. Same would go for if you wanted to increase your magic stat, you'd simply junction magic to your magic stat and voila, you'd be doing more damage. Final Fantasy VIII lets you customize your characters quite a bit, giving you control of what roles you want your party members to fulfill. Playing around with the junction system can be extremely extremely fun, there are no limits to how many GFs you can have equipped to one party member at a time, meaning if you really wanted to, you could equip all GFs in the game to one party member, though I don't really see the point in doing this. Combat in Final Fantasy VIII isn't too different from previous entries. The ATB meter once again makes a return and plays out just like the series has since the ATB meter first appeared in Final Fantasy IV. The two biggest changes, however, come from the GFs and drawing magic from enemies. Let's talk about the GFs. Depending on how you junction your GFs, GFs will either become essential to win battles or you'll rarely use them. By selecting GF category, you'll get to choose between the GFs your character has equipped. Once selected, a countdown meter will appear and a gray box with a GF's name and HP will be displayed. 
Think of this meter as the GF's ATB gauge. During the countdown, any damage the character receives will be absorbed by the GF, dealing damage to them instead of your character. Once a GF is KO'd, there is no using them for the rest of the battle. The only way to revive them is a GF returner. Personally, I loved how the GFs worked, and I'd love to see the concept return to another RPG at some point. Drawing, I think, perhaps, is another one of those biggest points of contention for a lot of people. Sitting there, drawing magic from an enemy can be pretty tedious. The drawing command has two categories to select, cast and stock. Selecting stock will add your spell to that character stock. You'll be able to equip this later or use it later if you so desire. Casting, on the other hand, will draw the spell and cast it then and there, meaning if you're in a pinch, you can draw Cure from an enemy and immediately cast it the same turn. Some bosses will also have GFs which you can draw. While no GF is 100% missable, it will be in your best interest to always check what bosses have to draw, or you can just Google search a list, but if you want to play it blind, it's in your best interest to do so. Let's talk about magic, because while magic plays out very similarly to other Final Fantasy games, it's different in some ways. Most RPGs will use up MP in order to cast magic. In FF8, however, MP is non-existent. This is because magic isn't something humans are born with to use. Only sorceresses have the potential to cast magic without using draw. Magic in this game is called paramagic, and it was discovered how to extract magic from creatures in order for humans to use it. As stated earlier, the characters will have a stock, and you can select the spell you want to use, and your character will cast it. Using one spell each time, basically magic in Final Fantasy VIII is a consumable. You can use magic from your junction of spells, but it will decrease your stat while one spell isn't going to make a huge difference, 10 to 20 of them could lower that stat. So be sure to replace it and contemplate if it's worth using that spell multiple times during a battle, especially if it's one that's hard to get. Limit Breaks make a return from Final Fantasy VII, and each character will have a special ability exclusive to them. This time though, rather than having a meter fill up, a Limit Break can either be used by a character reaching low health or using the magic spell aura. Squall's Limit Break is called Renzo Kuken. Squall will hit an enemy with consecutive hits for a good amount of damage, and depending on the weapon equipped, Squall will be able to hit an enemy with one of four finishing moves. Rough Divide, Faded Circle, Blasting Zone, and Lionheart. We will talk momentarily on how to get these within the next section. But with Renzo Kuken and Lionheart, there is a really good chance the enemy isn't escaping that attack alive. Quistus will be able to learn Blue Magic, which can be learned by using specific items dropped from enemies. Selfies is called Slots, and she will be able to choose a spell at random to use or multiple spells if it is listed on the spell name. Zell's is Dual, and you'll be able to use a wide range of martial arts. You're going to need to find magazines all across the world in order to learn the different abilities Zell will be able to use. You'll have input buttons and combos to pull them off. Renoa's Limit Break is called Combined and uses her dog, Angelo. And lastly is Urban's. His shot ability, you'll be able to fire multiple shots towards an enemy, utilizing different bullets from doing massive damage to inflict a status effect on an enemy. Weapons this time around cannot be bought. On your travels, you'll stumble across magazines cataloging new weapons. You'll make your way to a junk shop and construct weapons there. Each weapon will require a certain amount of items to craft, which are acquired by defeating enemies or using card mod. It's not required to get every weapon or necessary, but it will give your character benefits, and in Squall's case, it will affect what finisher he will be able to use at the end of Renzo Kuken. While on the topic of magazines, many more can be found across the world. Timber Manix can be acquired. This is a small magazine detailing details about the world and a certain character's travels across it. Occult fans, which are tied to side quests, Combat King for Zell's Limit Break, and Pet Pals for Renoa's Limit Break. Occult magazines will reveal more information about hidden side quests and even leading you to get a very powerful GF. Sometimes I've mentioned in this review, and no doubt you've heard it multiple times, is how easy it is to break the game. It's not uncommon for people early on to build Squall in such a way he can pretty much solo the game. This is done by utilizing card mod. 
and magic refining. Many people consider this to be a major flaw, and I get that. Not everyone is going to get it either, meaning the game can be extremely easy or it can be extremely hard depending on your knowledge how each of these systems work. The real flaw with this setup though is understanding it in the game's tutorials. They are vague and only cover the basics and with a throwaway line quiz that says check your tutorials in the menu, most are not going to pick up on it unless they actually do it. As a matter of fact, most of this game's lore and world building and plot are stuffed into these menus, NPC conversations and even in areas you wouldn't think to look. This is a flaw which has caused many people to criticize its story and yet despite it being a bad idea, Square Enix would reuse it in Final Fantasy XIII but make it 30 times worse. Final Fantasy games at this point are known for their small addictive time sink mini games that inflate the game's time and Final Fantasy VIII is no different. I really enjoyed these mini games, and while they are not great, they do break up the gameplay quite a bit and stop it from feeling like it's a run and battle, run and battle. Modern Final Fantasy games struggle to get this right. Though the Final Fantasy VII Remake seemed to realize this, there are scripted battles that fit right into the story I absolutely love, such as fighting a soldier while on top of a flying machine and having to press a button to block, kick, and punch your enemies. At one point, Squall and the party have to go on a mission to disconnect two trains, having to input a code while escaping the guards. I love this segment. It makes the player feel like they are part of this intense scene, and though it's not hard if you're playing on the old Steam version, which doesn't fit very well to an Xbox controller screwing up the inputs, you'll be just fine. It gives off this sense of adrenaline. Accompanying this section is a brilliantly composed song by Nobuo Uematsu, and it's easily one of the most memorable moments from Final Fantasy VIII. Final Fantasy VIII would also be the first game in the series to introduce a card game, Triple Triad. Though I've always found myself a fan of Tetra Master from Final Fantasy IX, because I find it a bit more enjoyable and much more simplistic and easier to figure out. I decided for the sake of this retrospective to take a plunge into Triple Triad, set aside my biases, and give it an honest shot. What did I discover? I honestly liked Triple Triad quite a bit more than Tetra Master. Triple Triad is pretty simple to figure out. Your cards will have letters and numbers indicating how strong your card actually is. The higher the number that your opponents, you will overtake the card by flipping it to your own color. With strategies and placements and paying attention to your opponent's moves, you'll achieve victory. Triple Triad really shines in how it changes the rules depending on the region of the world you're in. This makes the game really exciting and made me rethink my strategy a lot. So let's talk about these different rules and how they affect the game. First off, let's talk about the rules one and all. One will give you one card of your picking if victory is ensured. If you are playing with all, which I pretty much always recommend you should, just for card mod alone, Make sure you save often because like you're able to take every card your opponent has, they're able to take every card you have in your hand. Next up, let's talk about Elemental and Same. Elemental will play specific elemental icons on the board. So say you've got a card with a fire element, placing that card on a fire icon gives the card a plus one on all four sides, meaning each number is increased by one. While on the other hand, if you put a card on the icon that doesn't have an element or isn't the right element, you'll lose the value to each number on the card, making it weaker. Same will flip cards over if the player card has an equal value to the side the card is being played. There are variations of these rules and adding a bit more depth to the card game. The last rule I do want to mention though is open and random. Open will show you your opponent's cards, allowing you to better strategize your moves. If open is not played, all cards will be flipped and won't be revealed until they are played. Random will select cards out of your deck at random. This is the rule I found myself hating the most. During the game, Squall and the other characters will enter a dreamlike state and be taken back to the past to play as Laguna. While most of these are just small little sections carrying over character stats and such depending on the character playing out the dream sequence and fighting a few enemies, during a segment, Laguna makes his way through Lunatic Pandora, a late game dungeon Squall and the party find themselves going through. What you do in the past has small little effects in the present. By blowing up a boulder or opening the hatch on the door, it leaves a door open for the party to explore. 
usually just to a draw point, but it's still a cool little touch and Chrono Trigger is the only other game I can think of that has attempted something like this. So in order to do this retrospective justice, I do have to talk about the plot. So if you haven't played this game or have a desire to, skip to this part on the screen. Are we good? Sweet, let's go. There are two major points of contention when it comes to Final Fantasy VIII's story. Squall as a character and the whole amnesia thing thrown seemingly out of nowhere. Let's talk about the latter because this is a huge problem many people have with the game. During the Travia garden scene, Irvin reveals all of them grew up in an orphanage together, which all but him seems to have forgotten. The truth is there are small hints dropped in a few places, but the biggest hint to this is found at the computer desk at the beginning of the game. You have multiple times to check it, but many will not. There are a couple of scenes where they could have laid out subtle breadcrumbs to hint towards this reveal, but they missed the opportunity. The first one was when the assassination attempt with or Sorceress Edia took place. Irvin makes a comment about he can never do this and always tenses up at the last minute he has never hit his target before. By simply adding a line like, she raised me, Edia took care of me in an orphanage with some other kids, or she's someone very important to me would have been a perfect hint at this scene. There are a couple of instances they could have done this with Elena as well. A subtle hint by adding a small little line in disc 2. Don't you remember me, Squall? We grew up together. These two instances could have been more than enough to lay out a much better build up to the plot twist. Those things are really crucial to the plot. The whole idea was to raise them for this moment. When it came time to kill her to remove any emotion or sympathy coming with ending the reign of the sorceress, they had ample opportunity to drop small hints but didn't, instead they left major plot points out. As a matter of fact, something that is never really touched upon much or mentioned for that matter in the game was why telephones, radio waves, and forms of communication don't exist. It's actually a really cool concept. This was a sacrifice the world had to suffer to get rid of one of the most evil sorceresses, Sorceress Adele, something tied to Laguna's backstory. The only place this is mentioned is a small little bit in the tutorial menu. Seeing how big Final Fantasy VIII turned out though, it would have been impossible to add more scenes or moments with Laguna. Squall is also somewhat of a contentious point for a lot of people. Many consider Squall to be one of the best characters in Final Fantasy, while others cannot stand him as a character. As an introvert myself, I can fully relate to Squall. Introverts have feelings they want to be with others, but have a hard time expressing this. Sometimes they traumatically lost someone, or perhaps someone violated their trust, or if you're like me, you tend to be socially awkward and find having a conversation with people difficult at times lingering in the back of your head. What do they think of me? What if I do something stupid? I've certainly gotten a lot better and improved over my adult life and learned ways around some of these problems I have. Something else people bring up with Squall is how his change of heart comes on so suddenly. There are a couple of reasons for this. Let's get into a video game mechanic that destroys this setup and that is player choice. Kitase and his team decided it best to give the player the freedom to make decisions for Squall and let the players choose what Squall says. If you go about all the negative remarks towards Renoa, yeah, it's really hard to see this change happen. But choosing the more lighthearted and fun answers builds this up more. These moments reflect the small instances where Squall lets his guard down. The thing is, when you're an introvert, someone giving you attention makes you feel good, especially if they are interested in you. It can also be hard for someone to pick up on these social cues. Oftentimes, they come off as prying or a bit too personal and therefore annoying until you realize you're being flirted with. And when those interactions are gone, you feel lonely. You feel like the only person who really got to know you on a personal level is gone. The only one who genuinely seemed to care about you. The exact same way Squall acted when Renoa was in a coma. Even those small annoying traits can be endearing as they become something you enjoy about the person, but it takes the fear or losing them to really sink in how endearing those traits can actually be. If I'm being honest, I'm more upset we didn't get to see Adele and Laguna struggle against her. Adele was so terrifying and I found her much more interesting than Ultimisha. Who is Ultimisha and where does she come from? These are all questions unanswered that still keep me up at night. Apparently Laguna's section would have been a much bigger part of the game but was cut due to budgetary reasons or time. It would also have been nice to see as I found Adele very interesting as a villain. 
more than Ultimisha, I also found myself much more intrigued by the plot of the Sorceress War. Not to knock on the story of Final Fantasy VIII because I really enjoyed it, but Adele just seemed a lot less intimidating than the events of Laguna led her to be. I think Final Fantasy VIII is just meant to be taken a look at at face value and not analyzed. Kitase led Final Fantasy games seem to do this, they almost always seem to thrive on fan theory crafting to fill in the blanks of their stories. This has become even more evident as YouTube channels and forums have begun to pop up covering Square Enix content alone. Final Fantasy VIII does feel like a complete package, but the older I get and my mind has matured past that of a kid going through puberty, it's easier to find some of these plot holes and discrepancies overlooked. Kazushige Nojima is also really good at crafting lore and world building, and Final Fantasy VIII is no exception. It will be interesting to play and review Final Fantasy XIII and compare the two as Final Fantasy XIII relies far more heavily on the data log to tell the deeper parts of its story. Because of Final Fantasy VIII's story is so vague, it has led many to craft some very interesting fan theories such as Renoa is Ultimisha or Squall is dead. And while I think the latter is a well-crafted theory, I don't subscribe to it. A lot of the reasons so many fans have crafted such theories is because of the vague plot left by the developers. I find myself wanting closure to these stories, and I'm not necessarily a fan of such open-ended plots that encourage speculation. Final Fantasy VIII's characters seem to be really hit and miss for a lot of people, and I don't know why. I find the characters very endearing. The big part of contention for a lot of people is lack of backstory we learn about these characters. Maybe aside from Adele, I think the story is much better for it. The thing is, the characters don't need a backstory because it is in the grand scheme of things. They are just kids raised in a military school. We can pretty much guess what most of their backstory was. There really isn't a whole lot to tell about these characters. It's the interactions between these characters and the friendships with each other that they have that make them more memorable. Each party member feels like they add something to the game, feel like they belong, and don't feel like dead weight. This was something I loved about Final Fantasy VIII and customizing your characters to your play style, because while some of the limit breaks are much better and more effective in damage output, you can interchange any character you like and play as them. More often than not, Final Fantasy games have those useless characters who are not as good as other characters in battle. Final Fantasy VIII eliminates that problem. Even Laguna, Ward, and Kiros shine with what little time we get to spend with them. It really does a good job at building them up as characters. I think too many people expected the characters to have interesting backstories, a motive to fight. Final Fantasy VI and VII had stellar characters for this reason, with each character having an arc or side quest exploring these characters with the exception of a few. But the prevalent themes in these games also contributed to the reasoning behind why the characters were this way. Each character from those games had motives and reasons to fight against Shinra, Sephiroth, and the Empire. Final Fantasy VIII it's just their job, they are paid to do it. Sure, there is a level of loyalty and friendship that comes with it, a sense of responsibility and desire to protect those around them and uphold the contracts placed before them from the client, but their interactions on how they react with one another really helps sell these characters and probably a good chunk of why I feel these characters fit so closely together and are one of the series' best cast, dare I say, the best cast the series has seen. Welcome back, guys. If you skipped the spoiler section of this retrospective, glad to have you back on board. We can't talk about Final Fantasy without talking about its music. Nobuo Uematsu is a legend within the video game industry, and rightly so. Final Fantasy VIII is one of my favorite soundtracks from the series. As a matter of fact, I go back and forth on which soundtrack I enjoyed more, whether it be Final Fantasy VIII or Final Fantasy IX. They are both some of my favorites from the series. The wonderful and heart-pounding composition of Liber Fatalia to the calming and soothing sounds of Fisherman Horizon. Uematsu is a master at crafting themes and motifs within his soundtrack and using those motifs to accentuate emotion. The landing is a track getting your blood boiled and pumped and ready to fight. There is so much of this game's music I love. The battle themes are weaker compared to other entries but are still exciting in their own right. What really gets me every time though is the beautiful motifs incorporating the main theme of Eyes on Me into different songs, making up so much of this game's amazing music. Final Fantasy VIII also lets Uematsu spread his wings a bit and create music fitting in an almost militaristic world of war. Because of this, I really think it stands out, because it sounds so much like Uematsu but different from any other work he has done. 
Graphics in Final Fantasy have always been a huge emphasis at Square. Even back when Sakaguchi was still around, they were trying to push graphics to the next level. And while at the same time of its release, Final Fantasy VII was a graphical monument, it didn't take long for the game's graphics to age poorly, especially with its character models. Final Fantasy VIII released just two years later after Final Fantasy VII and blew Final Fantasy VII's graphics out of the water. The high fidelity graphics of FMVs are still something that hold up extremely well today. Even by today's standards, it's amazing to me to look back at this and marvel about how far ahead of the time these graphics really were. The pre-rendered backgrounds from Final Fantasy VII make a return, and while they look a lot more dated, they still look good. I love the details and care Square Enix put into these pre-rendered backgrounds. It really helps sell the world and bring it to life. If I'm being honest, I'd love for pre-rendered backgrounds to make a comeback. I feel there is so much untapped potential still to be achieved in this playstyle, especially with HD Picture. Since I am playing the older PC version, this isn't a remaster. The graphics you are seeing is the game modded, which I think for a fan-made mod, it makes it look really good for a PlayStation title. Let's be real for a moment. I can gush all day about how back in the day graphics, but it's a PlayStation 1 title, a game from 99, a 20-year-old game. Some people are going to point this out and have a harder time getting into it, but I still think from a graphical standpoint, it's aged far better than Final Fantasy VII. The last thing I want to touch upon with its graphics was the transitioning FMVs into gameplay seamlessly. While it certainly aged and doesn't look as well as it did back in the day, this was a novel concept ahead of its time and was something even Final Fantasy IX didn't try. I believe I read somewhere this was due to Yoshinori Katase having a background in film or at least he went to school for it. There is a certain point in the game, particularly reaching the second fight with Sorceress Edia and going to Esthar, I can really see people struggling with a difficulty spike. And if you've yet to master the junction system, taking the time to refine magic or draw magic from the enemies in the game, the final few fights can be absolutely devastating to the player. It is easy to catch up after getting the Ragnarok, but those wanting to close in on the end of the game might end up feeling frustrated. Well, Final Fantasy VIII's biggest flaw is its junction system and how it teaches the player this information. Final Fantasy VIII also doesn't hold your hand. It lets you figure it out and gives you brief tutorials on how to actually do this. As someone who feels games of late have become too handholdy or hates these annoying long sections of tutorials that just seem misplaced in a game, I like this. Quistus does tell the player more information in the menu about equipping GFs in the tutorial section of the game. Part of this does fall on the player and taking time to read through these segments of the tutorial. Many will consider it a flaw, but I don't. I'd much rather have a game removing these elements of a tutorial so many games try to incorporate and break immersion. It also makes replayability a breeze, as the tutorials are brief can quickly be skipped and it doesn't have the player during subsequent playthroughs sighing as they go through the monotony of an unskippable tutorial. Sometimes I just miss those days that games tossed you into the world and let you discover things for yourself or experiment with the game's mechanics in ways the developers intended or didn't always intend. Despite some very small but minor annoyances I have with Final Fantasy VIII, I still think it is a really solid game. It's easy to take a look at the draw system and complain about it, but you have other ways to get magic. While some may complain about how much you can break the game and make overpowered characters a flaw, I see it as a way to tailor the gameplay to your experience and how you want to play. The time and effort you put into it all adds up, and nothing is stopping you from making the game harder by not junctioning stronger magic. I will admit though, the level scaling doesn't really add anything to the game either. Since the enemies scale to Squall's level and you can just equip magic to a character to a stat, what little benefits levels do give you don't make much of a difference. Final Fantasy VIII is perhaps one of the most divisive titles on the PlayStation 1 of Final Fantasy games, but it's hardly a terrible game. There is so much Final Fantasy VIII does right, and while it has its flaws, it's got a lot to offer. Ultimately, I think it's going to come down to what you personally enjoy and expect from a Final Fantasy game. Personally, I love Final Fantasy VIII, and this playthrough only proved to me why I and many others cherish this game so much. Next time we take a look at Final Fantasy on the channel,
we'll be taking a look at the most divisive game in the series, Final Fantasy XIII. Is it as bad as people make it out to be? Well, you're going to have to subscribe to the channel so you can find out. This has been my Final Fantasy VIII retrospective. If you liked the video or found it helpful, consider giving it a like and sharing it on social media. Links to my socials down below will also be down below in the description. And most importantly, stay happy, be happy, game happy. Spoons is checking out.